to get lower in the sky. And I stood up, enough, enough is enough. And I called to the people of God, I said, people of God, have you had enough? Come, gather around here, gather around the altar of Jehovah, the God of Israel. And as the people gathered around, I didn't say a word. I let them gather. And they sat, and they stood, and they knelt, and they crammed in as close as they could. It was a hot day, stiflingly hot. Remember, we hadn't had rain, and it was drought. And rather than speak, I just began to work. And I picked up the heavy stones of the altar of Yahweh, and I began to rebuild God's altar where it had once stood. Twelve stones. Twelve stones for twelve tribes of Israel. One stone for each tribe. This was the altar of Jehovah, the God of Israel, the God of the universe. And when I finished reconstructing the altar, then I got the wood. I got the wood for the altar, and I arranged the wood on top of the altar. And then I took the offering, and I placed the offering on top of the altar. I said, now it's time, God, to show your power. Undeniable, right? They've had all the advantages. It's time, God, to reveal who you are. But God said, not yet. I said, what do you mean, not yet? I mean, surely you don't want them to pray some more, please. You don't want them to pray some more, right? He said, not that. He said, give me more disadvantages. Put me at a greater disadvantage. I said, how can I do that? What more could we possibly do here in the heart of Baal country, at the top of a mountain in Baal country, in a sanctuary of Baal, doing a thing that Baal is supposed to be in control of, having 450 prophets praying against me? What more could I do to put you at a disadvantage? But God was silent, and he didn't tell me. And so I said, all right, all right, what, what do you want, God? Disadvantage. Make it impossible, God said. Make it impossible. How can I make it impossible? Any more impossible than it already is. You're going to light the fire. Impossible to light that fire. What can I do? What can I do to make it impossible to light this fire for you, God? As I was thinking and pondering, and God was sitting there waiting for me to catch up to him, I looked over here, and I saw one of the Israelites drinking out of a small cup. Remember, we were in a drought, so he was drinking from a small cup. They were passing this cup around, and he spilled a little, and it dribbled down his beard onto his sleeve and onto the ground. And I watched as the ground sucked up the water instantly, just like that. It was so dry, I just wanted it right in. And he quick grabbed his sleeve, and he sucked the water out of his sleeve because he didn't want to waste any of it. Water. Fire. Impossible. Water, fire, impossible. Impossible fire, water. Oh. Huh. Yeah? I got it. Finally, I got it. So I grabbed eight young men and I said, You guys, you eight, I need you to go down over the hill here. Down at the bottom, there's a spring, the Kishan Spring. I want you to go to that spring. I want you to take these four barrels between you and I want you to fill them up with water. And I want you to bring them up here. And as they went to do that, I grabbed the shovel and I began to dig. I began to dig a trench around the altar of God. And I kept digging and I kept digging and I kept digging and digging I wanted the trench to be big enough to make a point. It was big enough to hold a lot of water. Until the time they got back, carrying their barrels filled with water, I could see people 
all around starting to lick their lips. They thought, oh, this prophet, he's so sensitive. He cares for our needs. He wants to provide us with a drink of water before the spectacle. He wants to make sure we're greatly comforted before God does his thing. He cares for us. They were disappointed, though, when I told the young men, come forward. And they brought the barrels up and they set them in front. And I said, you guys, take your barrel and pour it on top of the altar. There was a gasp by some of the people. This precious water wasted on the altar? I said, do it. They kind of looked around. I said, do it. And they did it. They poured the water over the offering and down the wood. Next barrel, they poured it down over the offering, over the wood. The wood was soaking up the water. Next one, over the offering, into the wood, onto the stones. Next one, over the offering, into the wood, onto the altar of the God of the universe, Jehovah. I said, now go down and get four more. And off they went. They came back. Four years on, over the offering, into the wood, onto the stones of the altar. Again, onto the stones of the altar, onto the stones, onto the ground. Their ground soaked up the water and it was damp. I said, get four more, it's not enough. They went, they got four more. Onto the offering, onto the wood, saturating the wood, onto the stones, onto the ground, it began to puddle in the trench around the altar. Again, four, next bucket, next barrel. Again, 12 barrels in all. 12 barrels, one for each of the tribes of Israel. This was an impossible task. The altar was soaking wet. The wood was saturated with water. The offering was drenched. The trench was filled. There is no way that you or I could have lit that fire. We would have had to start a fire with something else, build it up, and then place the wood, the saturated wood, gingerly around it so that it would dry out as it burned. So now, God, is this impossible enough for you? Now we can show that God has the power to do anything and accomplish everything, no matter where it is, because he has true power. And so I stepped forward and I began to pray. What do you think I prayed for? Yeah. Not fire. I didn't pray for fire from heaven. I didn't pray for a miracle. I didn't pray for God to light that altar. I didn't pray for some divine heavenly sign. I prayed for something far more important. I prayed that God would make his name known among his people. That God would reveal himself to his people and that their hearts would turn back to him and that they would recognize that I was his prophet. God, reveal yourself to your people. And just like that, make yourself known, just like that, God answered my prayer, but not with words, with boom, fire from heaven. It knocked me flat on my back. I was stunned as I was looking up in the, uh, in the air. My eyes were blinking, the stars were in my eyes, the hot spots from the bright light that had come down. My ears were ringing from the loud clap of thunder. There was embers falling all around. I could smell the acrid smell of smoke burning in my nostrils. I was stunned. I laid there on the ground and just shook for a second. What just happened? But after a minute, I sat up and I looked at the altar or where the altar used to be and there was nothing but a crater with hot embers. God had answered with power. And fire from heaven had eaten the offering, the wood, the stones, the water, and the dirt right around the offering. And I realized that God had responded to my prayer with power. Now it was time for the people to respond to God. So I said, people, grab those prophets of Baal and kill them. And they did. They saw the undeniable power of God and they responded. And they killed those prophets of Baal. You see, 
the people of God knew that they needed to make a clean break from anything that was drawing them away from the worship and their commitment and their loyalty to the one true God of the universe. And so they made that clean break that day. They made a decision. They acted and they made that clean break. The people of God today need to make a clean break with whatever it is that's keeping them from the wholehearted devotion, commitment, and worship of the one true God. What is it that's in our lives that's keeping us from Him? What is it that's standing in our way from wholehearted commitment to Him? Are there areas in our lives that we say, God, you can have our whole life except for this one little area. Just this one piece, God, that's all I'm going to keep to myself. If we've got those areas, then we're not worshiping Him wholeheartedly. We, as a people of God, have to make a decision before God will respond to us. But when we make that decision, when we make that clean break, then God responds with power in our lives. If you want to see and experience God's power in your life, make a clean break from whatever it is. And he will. You see, that night, that very night, not only did God respond with power at the altar, but he brought rain upon the land and the drought was over. See, God had the power to do anything, anywhere, even in the heart of Baal country, to accomplish everything that he had set his heart to do. And he has that same power today. If we make a clean break from whatever keeps us from God, then he will respond with power in our lives. Let's pray.